Hello Godineus! Making a user interface for a game can be quite challenging, but every game needs one to give the player vital information and to make your game easy to use. A user interface must also adapt to different screen sizes and resolutions, so players with all kinds of different hardware can play your game. Thankfully, Godot has a quite powerful UI system built in. So we are going to have a look into what Godot's UI system can do and how you can use it effectively. There's a lot of ground to cover, so this video is quite long. Feel free to take a break every now and then and come back later when you are refreshed. This is a beginner level tutorial. We are going to do everything with the editor, so you can even follow along if you don't have any knowledge of GDScript. So we are in Godot and I have created a small scene which we will use to explore Godot's UI system. As an example, we are going to use a city builder or a strategy game where your units will collect resources and then build something. Of course, we're not going to build the whole game here. So what I have done is I've just created a little backdrop which simulates the game running below our user interface. And I have also added a camera 2D so we can move the camera and see what is happening. In a game like this, your units usually collect resources. And what we want to do is we want to show the player which resources currently have been collected so the player can use them. I have prepared a few icons for these resources. So we have a little flash icon, which can maybe be energy. Maybe we move it here. I have also a barrel, which could indicate food or maybe oil because these are robots and they probably don't need food. And we have, of course, a cogwheel icon, which is maybe spare parts, right? These robots need to repair themselves. So, okay. So we zoom in and you can see this boundary here, which shows us how big the screen will be when we play our game. So let us quickly push the button and play it. And you see uh, what we get in our window is exactly this boundary. Okay, so now we can use this to set up our little dashboard, if you will. So let's maybe move it here and maybe also make this a bit smaller, move it here, make this a bit smaller, move it here. And we may be also adding some labels. So let's add a label. So a label can help us to display text and maybe give it a number. Maybe we have 100 of this energy. So label is up here. Everything you add is up here. So now we can duplicate it. Control D or Command D is duplicating it. Moving down, duplicate again. Okay. So now the text is pretty hard to read. So we can maybe add a little background. There's another note for this, which is a panel. And again, your notes appear in the upper left. So maybe resize this a bit. And then over here, the panel is now above everything, which is not what we want. When it's on the bottom of the tree, it renders above everything else. And if I move it up, it renders below. Now we have a UI. Isn't that great? Have a look. Great. It works. So are we done yet? Well, not really. This only works for our little example. If I choose a different resolution or go full screen, you can see how this completely falls apart. It's no longer in the upper right corner. It is way too small to read in full screen. It's just not good. So how can we make a UI that works for all resolutions and all aspect ratios? Godot approaches this problem with a thing called a reference resolution. So what Godot does is it allows you to design everything in one resolution that you think most players will have. And then Godot will scale it up and down according to some rules. So where can we set up this reference resolution? We can do this in the project settings. So we go to project, project settings, window, and there you have it viewport width, viewport height. So this is the reference resolution. Which one should we pick? 
Well, we can use any resolution that we want, but it's a good idea to use a resolution that most players will likely have, because then what you design is what most players will immediately get without having to care about scaling. So which resolutions do most players currently have? Well, we can have a look at the Steam hardware survey. That is a survey that Steam does every quarter, and they collect information from all of their players, what kind of hardware are they using, and they are also having information about the resolutions that they are using. So if we are looking at the screen resolution in the hardware survey, you can see that the most popular resolution right now is 1920 by 1080. So let's go back into Godot and we start with 1920 by 1080. Then we close and you can see that our screen rectangle has not updated. Oh, now it has. If it doesn't update for you, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. You can go to project, reload current project, save and reload. And now we are back. Great. Now we can just move everything over to the new right and play again. And great. We are done. No, we're not done because what I have just shown you is the worst way in which you can build a UI. The first problem that we have is that this does not work very well with cameras. If I take my camera and if I move it a bit, maybe here, and I play the game again, you can see that our UI moves off screen. And the reason for this is that our UI lives in the same space as our game. So if I move the camera, the game moves, and the UI also moves. How can we fix that? We can fix that with a canvas layer node. So we go to add node, search for canvas layer, add this node, and we put it in here below our game because we want to render our UI above the game. And we saw earlier that when you move stuff up in the tree, it renders below. And when you move it down in the tree, it renders above. We take all of this and we move it inside of this canvas layer. Camera is still offset, you can see it here. And you see that now our UI is in a completely separate layer, which is not affected by camera movement, and that is much better. Okay, let's have a look at our little dashboard up here. It looks pretty racked because all the icons are not really aligned and the text is also not really aligned. So it looks pretty bad. And we can, of course, try to fix this by moving it around with the mouse until it looks right. But this is not very efficient. There's a much better way of doing this, which is using containers. Godot has some very useful nodes built in, which automatically align components according to some rules. If we look at this, it looks a bit like a grid. We have a column and a second column and we have three rows. And there is a built-in container in Godot which can lay out components in a grid. And this is called a grid container. So we add this, look for grid container. And again, new components always end up here. So we move this over here. And you can see it's not really visible and that is because containers just lay out their child components and do not display anything by themselves. So we move the container maybe up here and we move all of these things as child nodes. And you can see something very interesting happening. It looks like it aligned our labels, but it did not align our icons. And the reason for this is that containers only work on UI components. They do not work on sprites or anything else. All UI components have this greenish color here and our icons do not. So we cannot use sprites for this. We need to use something else. And what would we use for this? Well, we have a look into our UI components. All UI components derive from controls, so we can Look here at control and we can look, okay, what component could work? We have a color rect, we have a lot of other stuff and there's a thing down here called texture rect. Control that displays a texture, which is exactly what we need. So we take a texture rect and then we add our flash icon here to the texture, add a few more of these. Again, control or command D is duplicating and then we just change the textures of these. The second one gets the barrel 
and the third one gets the cogwheel. Now we have that. And if we have a look at the grid container, you can see that it's rendering them all in one column. But we want two columns. And we can set this up here. Right now, columns is one, so we say we want two columns. That still doesn't look right. And that is because the container renders its children in the order in which you have given them. So what we want is we want an icon, a label, an icon, a label. So we put icon. Maybe we also give this a name. So we say this is the flash icon and energy label. And then we put here the barrel icon and the food label. And finally, we have the cogwheel icon and the spare parts label. Now we have icon label, icon label, icon label. But the icons are way too big. How can we fix that? Let's have a look at the settings of the texture rack. And you can see there's a setting called export mode. And currently it's keep size. So it will try to keep the size of this texture. This texture is pretty big. So what we can do is we change this export mode to something else, maybe ignore size. That is at least a bit better. Let's try what happens if we make this for the other two as well. Ignore size. Now it has completely disappeared. To understand why this has disappeared, we need to learn a bit more about how containers do their work. What containers do is they ask each of their child nodes, how big do you want to be? So they ask this icon, how big do you want to be? They ask this label, how big do you want to be? And once they have asked all their child components, they then calculate where each component goes. So they have asked this label, how big do you want to be? And the label looks, okay, I need to display this 100. So I need to be three characters wide and I need to be as high as my font. So if I add another number here, you see that the label automatically gets bigger because it reports, okay, I need more space. I have more text. What I have said here is ignore size. And ignore size, if we look at the documentation, the size of the texture won't be considered for minimum size calculation. So what this node will now do, it will say, okay, I don't need any space. Thank you very much. So maybe let's try a different mode. Maybe let's try fit width. That looks a lot better. And fit width says the height of the texture will be ignored. The minimum width will be equal to the current height, useful for horizontal layouts. And this is actually what we have. We have a horizontal layout, icon, label. The other ones automatically got bigger. Why is that? They are still on ignore size. Now the reason for this is that the first icon now has some size and this is a grid container. So it gives all the icons in this column the same width, no matter how they are set up. But if I, let's say, hide this icon, then we have the same problem again, because this icon now says, I don't need any more space. And the other icons, they're still saying, well, I don't need any more space. So it's best if we set all of these icons to the same thing fit with. Now we can have a look at our labels. And the labels, they're pretty tiny. So maybe we can change their font size. And we can change the font size if we go to theme overrides, font sizes, and then we can say maybe we do a 32 here. That is a lot better. Now you can see the next problem. The good thing is, is that our icon automatically has grown because now we have more height and the export mode fit width uses the height to determine the width. However, if we look at our barrel here, you can see that it's not looking right. And we can fix this with the stretch mode setting. Right now it's set to scale, so it will just scale according to whatever width and height the container assigns to it. But we don't want this to distort itself, so we use keep aspect. And we also use this for the barrel and the cogwheel. So we say keep aspect. And now this looks a bit better, but you can see it is moving to the left. We don't want this. We want to have it centered. So what we can do is we say keep aspect centered. And now it's centered. Okay, so now we can move this grid container up here so we can read it a bit better. And now we have another problem, and that is that our panel has a fixed size. So when I say I have a lot of energy, like really, really a lot, it will go over our panel. We can fix this with another container, which is called a panel container. So we add a panel container. 
So this is the same as a panel, but it has some extra functionality. We can delete this. And we move the panel container over here. And now we put our grid container in our panel container. And you see what happens. The panel container, it again asks its child node, which is the grid container, how big do you want to be? And the grid container says, okay, I have all these components, so I need to be this big. And the panel container then makes itself as big as is needed for the grid container. So if I change the label, you can see that it automatically resizes. So it looks quite nice, but still not great. We have a little problem here on the right side where there's not really a border. It, it looks very ugly. How can we say, I want some extra space here. There's another container for this, which is the margin container. So we add the child node, we add a margin container. And now what we do is we put the margin container in the panel container and we put the grid container in the margin container. So what will now happen is that the margin container is asking the grid container, how big do you want to be? And then we can set up in the team overrides constant a margin. So maybe we say we want to have 20 pixels to the right or maybe 15 pixels to the right. So the margin container will add a bit of margin and then tell the panel container, okay, I need to be as big as the grid container plus this margin. And the panel container will automatically resize itself to fit all this. And it shows why it's important to use containers for layout and not doing it manually. Because containers automatically compensate when the text in your interface changes. It's also important if you want to do localization work where the length of a text can vary quite a bit between different languages. Okay, so this is quite a bit better than before, but it still doesn't really look nice. If you look at the UI and you look at our game, they don't really fit together very well. That is because our UI currently uses the Godot default look that comes with Godot and while this is serviceable, it's not really fitting the theme of our game. So how can we change this? Well, we can change this with a theme. There is a thing called themes in Godot. And we can create one with create new resource. And then we look for theme and we create a theme. And we call this maybe our theme. And now you can see we have a new section down here where we can change how things look in Godot. So the first thing we want to do is we want to change how these labels look. We can change it by using this little eyedropper icon here. Click on it and then click on the label. And now we have a new type here in our theme label. So we can now say the label should look different. And there's a lot of settings that we can change for a label. We can change its colors. We can change some constants for the label, but we want to change the font. So we go to font and we click this plus icon, which allows us to change the font. And then we can select a new font. We do a quick load and I have added a font, which looks a bit more like writing on a blackboard. It's still a bit tiny. So we also change the default font size and we say this is 32. So now you can see here how the label has a different look now, but it still doesn't show in our game. Why is that? Well, we need to tell our component that it should use this new theme. There's three ways in which we can do this. The first way is we just take this label and we go to theme and we drag our theme in here and you can see it now uses this theme. But this is very cumbersome because we would now need to change all the labels. So we don't do it this way. Let's revert this and revert this. What we can also do is we can set the theme at the root of our UI tree. So I put it in here. And you can see that all the labels now change. And that is because if you set a theme here, then all the components that are below this node will also use the theme unless they have their own team. But it's still something that we need to set up for each node and that we can forget. But there's a third way in which we can do this. 
And this is in the project settings. So we go to project, project settings, and we need to enable advanced settings for this. And then we can go down here and find GUI theme. And then we have a setting custom in which we can load our theme. This needs a restart of the editor. So we press save and restart. And now you can see that our labels use the new theme. So now our labels fit the game a bit better, but still I don't like this panel container. So how about we add a wooden border around this? We can do this also in the theme, but if we look down here, there's not really a panel container visible. In this case, we can add a new type using this plus button here. So we click on there, we type panel container, because that is the one we want to change. And if you look at the panel container, there's really only one setting that we can change, which is the panel. We click the plus button here, and then we can say how the panel should be rendered. And we have a few options here. We have a stylebox empty, a stylebox texture, a stylebox flat, and a stylebox line. So empty is what it says. It's just rendering nothing, which is not what we want. We have the stylebox flat, which renders a flat color, similar to how it's done right now, because right now it's using a stylebox flat. And we have Starbucks line, which renders a line, which we don't need here. It's more a thing if you have separators. So what we want to use is Starbucks texture. And then we can click on it. And now we can see a preview up here how it would look like. So first thing is we need a texture. I have created a few textures here. So we take this frame small thing and we put it in here. And now we have a preview. Uh, we see it's a wooden frame, but it renders kind of strangely here on the sides. And that is because it just takes this texture and it stretches it. But what I want is to keep the borders unstretched and just stretch this inner part. And we can do this by setting the texture margins here. So if I set the texture margin here to 24 pixels on each side, you can see how it now only stretches the inner part. So we leave a margin of 24 pixels on all sides, which are not stretched, and only the inner part gets stretched. We have updated our theme, but our container does not update. And the reason is that UI components don't actively monitor if the theme changes. You need to reload them. So what we can do is we go to Scene, Reload Saved Scene, and you can see it has updated. And now that looks a lot nicer. Okay. Let's say we want to show the player some kind of mission dialogue where they can see a mission and then they can accept it or decline it. How would we do that? Well, we can create a second panel container and set it up there. So let's add another panel container and move it somewhere here. And then we add some label for the text. So label, so maybe we call this title. And we write mission. And we duplicate it and we make this text. So this should be the text. And for the text, I will just use some dummy text. And maybe we set this to wrap because right now it's putting all of the text in one line and we want to automatically wrap it. So there's an auto wrap setting here and we want to wrap on every word. So we use that. But it still looks not right because they seem to render on top of each other, which is not what we want. We want to stack them. We want to have the title up here and then we want to have the text below. And we can also do this with a container. There's a thing called a VBox container, a vertical box, VBox. A container that arranges its child controls vertically, which is exactly what we want. So we take a VBox container, we put it into panel container, and then we put our labels inside of this VBox container. And now you can see the mission is up here and the text is up there. And we can nicely resize this and you can see that the text is automatically flowing around here, so it looks nice. Good. However, I would like to make a few changes. First off, I think this border should be bigger. So how can I make that? I have already set up how a panel container should look. So if I change this border to make it bigger, then this border would also get bigger, and we don't want that. And we can do this by adding a variant to our theme. 
So we click on our theme and we click the plus button and we want to make a custom type or a custom variant for a panel container. So we say maybe big panel container. Don't be confused that this is now empty. You can still click add type. And we have now made a custom type, which currently is not based on any other component. But if we go to this icon here, we can say which should be the base type. And we say this should be some kind of panel container. So we select the panel container here. And now it knows it is a panel container. Now we can go here and we see we now have the panel setting. We add the stylebox texture. Click on the stylebox texture and we change the texture to frame big. And again, we want to set the margins. So this time it's a bit bigger. So we use 48. So now we need to tell this panel container that it should use our variant. And we can do this by going to theme, type variation, big panel container. And it uses the big border. And this is how you can make variations of controls in your theme. We want to make another variation for this mission label. I want this to be bigger than the rest of the text. And we already know how to do this. So we go to our theme and we add another variation and we name this maybe header. And you can see Godot has some variations for labels already, which are called header large, header medium, header small. So we take this header large, and then we can change the font size for this header large maybe to 48. Now we can say to this title in theme, type variation, header large. And now we get a large header. And we also want to have this centered. So we go to horizontal alignment and say this should be centered. Now we want to add two buttons which allow the user to accept the mission or to decline the mission. So we add a button and we put this in our VBox container and maybe we call this OK. And we make a second button, call this cancel button and the other one we call OK button. And so, so now we have these, but you can see they are still using the default look and we don't want that. We want to have nice looking buttons. So we go back to our theme. We already know how this works. We can use this eyedropper here and there's a button. You can also use the plus on this side. It works the same way, but this is a bit quicker. Okay, so the buttons, they also have uh, a font. So we change this to our chalk font and we also change the font size to 32. And now we look at the style boxes and you can see buttons have quite a few of them for each state of the button. Uh, it could be in a normal state like this button. It could be in hover state when I move the mouse over. It could be pressed when I click it and so on. And we need to change the style boxes for each of them. So let's start with the disabled. Again, we click the plus, change it to a style box texture. Then I have already made a lot of buttons here. We change the texture margins. And we're done with this one and then we continue. Okay, I have set up everything. And again, we need to reload our scene. So it picks up the changes. First, we may want to save it. So reload our scene. And now you can see that we have the buttons with the new start. This looks a lot nicer. Now we want to lay out the buttons in a horizontal way. And just like there's a VBox container, there's also an HBox container, which can do this for us. So we use an HBox container. Container arranges its side controls horizontally, which is exactly what we want. 
we put it here and we put all our buttons into this HBox container. Maybe make this a bit bigger so we have a bit of room to work with. Okay. Now I would like that these buttons have the same size. Because right now the OK button, it has a lot smaller size than the cancel button. And the reason for this is, again, this container asks its child nodes, how big do you want to be? And the OK button says, you know, I just have this OK in there. I'm OK with this small size. While the cancel button says, you know, I have this big cancel thing, I need more size. So how can we tell this OK button that it should use more size, that it should not just take its minimum size? We can do this in the layout settings. And this is the part that confuses a lot of people because it's not really straightforward, but we're going to take it extra slow and explain how it works. So we are having the OK button selected. We go to layout, container sizing, and then we can see some options. And there's two options that we can check. We can have this expand flag, turn on and off, and we can set some other behavior, which we will explain shortly. With this expand flag, you can change how much space the control requests from its parent container. Right now it is unchecked and the button will only request as much space as it needs to render its OK plus the little border around it. If I turn it on, the button says to the HBox container, you know what, I need only this OK thing, but if you have more space, then I would like to have it. And if we look at the HBox container, you can see this is all the space that the HBox container right now has. The OK button says, I would like to have as much space as you can give me. So what the HBox container now does is it's asking the cancel button, how much space do you need? And the cancel button says, I need this little bit, bit of space to render my cancel. And then it looks, OK, I have this much space to give. I remove the space for the cancel button, so I give the rest to the OK button. And now the OK button gets bigger, which is nice, but we're still not having the same width. So what happens if we tell the cancel button to also request a lot of space? So we get to layout, container sizing, and we also say expand. So now the HBox container has two children, and they are telling him, OK, give me all the space that you can spare. So what does the HBox container now do? Well, it looks at how much space it has, and then it gives it evenly to all its child nodes. And now the buttons have the same size. But what if you want to have different sizes for each of these buttons? So maybe this OK button should get a quarter of the size, and the Cancel button should get three quarters of the size. We can do this with the stretch ratio setting that you can see down here. And it works like this. The container will look at all the controls that say, I want to expand. And then it will sum up all the stretch ratios of these controls. So right now, the OK button has a stretch ratio of 1. And the Cancel button has also a stretch ratio of 1. So it will sum these up, and you get 2. And then it will assign each control a fraction of the space, which is their stretch ratio divided by the sum. So OK button has a stretch ratio of 1 divided by the sum, which is 2. So it gets 1 divided by 2. It gets half the space. And the cancel also gets 1 divided by 2, which is half the space. If we want to give this 1 quarter, and this three quarters, then the sum of these stretch ratios needs to be four because we want to give quarters, right? So divided by four. So we set the stretch ratio here to three and we get the correct result. Again, all the stretch ratios are added. So OK button has one, cancel button has three. Sum of this is one plus three is four. So we have four. And now the OK button gets 1 divided by 4, which is 1 quarter. And the Cancel button gets 3 divided by 4, which is 3 quarters. And we maybe make another example. Let's say the OK button should have 2 thirds and the Cancel button has 1 third. How do we do that? Well, again, we want thirds, so the sum needs to be 3. 
So we give the cancel button one and we give the OK button two. And now the OK button has two divided by the sum, which is three, so two thirds. And the cancel button has one divided by three, which is one third. So now we know how this export flag works. So what is this fill thing? Well, this fill thing, it only works if you have this export flag ticked. To show it better, I will temporarily hide this cancel button and we only work with the OK button. So right now it is set to fill. And fill means make me as big as all the space that I have requested. And say you want to have this button in the middle. Well, you can change it to shrink center. So the button will still request all the space because what it requests is decided by this expand flag. So if expand is off, it will only request the minimum size. If it's on, it will request all the size it can get. And this flag controls how the button uses the size it has gotten, right? So the container says, okay, fine. You can have all of this space. And now the button says, okay, I take all of this space, but what do I do with it? Do I fill it out? Or do I shrink myself and go to the center? Or do I shrink myself and go to the beginning? Or do I shrink myself and go to the end? But if you don't have this expand flag set, then the container will only give this button as much space as it needs. So it says, okay, I only need as much space as this. This is, this is all the space we have. And now I can set whatever I want here because I only have this tiny bit of space. It doesn't really matter what I set here because everything will look the same. And this is what confuses people because it says fill here, but if you just do fill, it will not fill this space, right? So again, this expand flag says, how much space do I want? And this other flag says, what do I do with the space that I got? Okay, so let's add the cancel button again. What I want now is that this button and the cancel button, they have the same size. We already know how to do that. So we set both to expand and we give them the same stretch ratio. So now everyone has one, but I want them to be centered. How can I do that? There's a few ways in which I could try this. So there is, for example, a center container. Center. So we move it up here. And maybe we put the HBox container inside of the center container. So see, this is the center container, and now this is the HBox container, and now there are the buttons. So they're now centered, but they don't have the same size anymore. So why is that? Well, the reason for this is that the center container only gives its child nodes as much space as they need. So you see, while this HBox container is inside of the center container, I don't even have an option to expand. The center container does not support it. So the HBox container only gets as much size as its chart nodes need. So there's no space to expand because the center container will not give the HBox container enough space. So this is not working. Let's move it up here and delete the center container because that is not working. There's another trick which we can use to make this work. And this is a spacer control. And the spacer control is really just an empty control. So you use the control node, which will render nothing. And now we set this control to export. Layout, container sizing, export. And now you can see that it gets one third of the space because it's export and it has a stretch ratio of one. And we have three components. So one plus one plus one is three, and it gets one third. If we duplicate this and add another control down here, it gets a fourth of the space. And this effectively centers our two other buttons. That is a nice trick, which we can also use to move these buttons down here. Because the label is nice with the mission, but I would like to have these buttons at the bottom. We can again add a control and put it here above the HBox container. And now we want to set its layout to expand. There's also a second place where you can set this, which is up here. So we want to vertically expand it. So if you don't want to click here, you can also set it up here. So now this expands and it takes all the space it can get. 
all the other controls take the space that they need. And this spacer control, which we can also maybe name spacer, it's always a good idea to rename your nodes so you know what they do. So space two. And the spacer control will grow and shrink depending on how much space is available. So if I make this really small, there's no more space, so it will be really small. But if I make it bigger, it will automatically grow and push the buttons down. So we have now made our UI much better by using containers to automatically lay out our controls. But there's still a problem. If I run this, and if I change the size of my window, the UI does not what I would like. The first problem is that this thing should always be in the upper right corner, no matter how I change this window size. And also I would like this to always be in the center, no matter how I change my window size. And we can do this with anchors. If you look at this panel container up here, which I have selected, you can see there's these little pins up here. And these pins tell where this container is anchored to. So right now it is anchored to the upper left corner of the screen. So when I move it, the position is always relative to the upper left corner of the screen. So what we want to do is we want to anchor it to the top right corner of the screen. And we can do this up here by choosing an anchor preset. And you see there's a lot of presets already there. We want to choose top right. And now these pins are in the upper right corner. And now it's anchored to the upper right. So if I now move this and I run the scene, you can see that it's now moving with the upper right corner of the screen automatically. And the same way we can anchor this panel container here. So we can say we want to anchor this to the center. So if we run the game, then the mission container is nicely centered no matter how we resize the window. We're almost done, but there's still one problem to solve. And we can see the problem when we make the window smaller. If a player only has a small resolution, then everything gets squished together or cut off, and that is not what we want. What we want is that this scales with the resolution of the player. And we can set this up in the project settings. So we go to project, project settings, window, and we maybe disable these advanced settings because we don't need them anymore. And the interesting part is the stretch mode. This controls how the game is scaling. Right now it's set to disabled, which produces what we just saw. So let's try something different. We have a few options here. We have disabled, we have canvas items, and we have viewport. And if we hover over this mode, we get a little explanation. So disabled, we already know it doesn't work, so we don't look at this anymore. So we have canvas items or viewport. And for canvas items, it says the base size specified in width and height in the project settings is stretched to cover the whole screen, which sounds a lot like what we want. We want this base size to be stretched to cover the whole screen. Okay, so let's use that. And now let's make it smaller. That is, that is a lot better. You see that it just scales the game up and down and it does not push our components together. So maybe we make it big and you see if you have a huge resolution like this 4K here, then you get to use this resolution. Everything is crisp and automatically scaled up the right way. However, you can see that we have a bit of black bars. If we go to widescreen, we get pillar boxes on the left and the right. And if we scale down the other way, we get letter boxes on the top and the bottom, which we don't want. So we're not fully done yet. So let's go into the project, project settings. And we have a look at this other setting here, which is called aspect. Right now it's set to keep. I don't want to keep this aspect. I just want it to adapt to the aspect. So let's try ignore. Let's see what that does. OK, that is not good. Now it looks like jelly. So yeah, it ignores the aspect. So we actually want to keep the aspect, but we want to grow. We want to use the extra space that we have. It should just show more of the game world.
So let's look again at the project settings. Let's try the next one, keep with. Let's see what that is doing. Let's move to the right. Oh, we still seem to have black bars. What happens if we move to the other way? Okay, that looks more like it. So you see vertically, it already uses more space here. If we have more space, so it the UI stays the same, but we show more of the game world. But horizontally, we still get the black bars. Okay. So we have keep height, which will probably work the other way around. So let's try expand. Yeah, that looks more like it. So if we have more space horizontally, it will grow horizontally. You see the dialogue stays in the middle. We just get more room left and right. And this also stays in the top right corner the way it should be. So that is great. And if we go the other direction, yeah, it also works the same. You know, our backdrop ends here, but it doesn't really matter. So this is what we want. In this video, we have learned how we can make a game user interface with Godot. We learned that we can use controls to represent UI elements, and we use containers to arrange these controls for us automatically. We learned that we can use a canvas layer to separate our UI from the game world so it does not move when we move the camera. We learned that we can use a theme to change how our components look. We also learned that there can be different variants of a component inside of a theme. So we can, for example, make headlines and normal labels. We learned that containers ask their children for their size and that children by default request their minimum size. We also learned that if we set the expand flag, then children will request more size than they need. Children then use the various shrink and fill settings to use the extra space that they have been given. We learned that we can use the stretch ratio setting to divide extra space among the children. And we learned that we can use spacer controls to push other controls around. Finally, we had a look at anchoring to pin our controls to a certain location of the screen. And we looked at scaling settings to make our game render correctly at different aspect ratios and resolutions. This has only been an overview on the basics of Godot's UI system that should give you the fundamentals to build your own UI. There's a lot more to learn that this video didn't cover. Nevertheless, I hope this has been helpful. If you have questions or would like to suggest topics for a new video, please post them in the comments. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and maybe consider subscribing to the channel so you get notified when new videos are posted. Thank you very much and happy go to nearing.